porous media is essentially a material that contains pores. In other words, these are materials that have voids in them. In this video, I will show you how to create a virtual domain of such a porous media. I will also show you how to undertake representative volume element modeling of such porous media, as well as end up with generating stress and strain plots for these materials. Let's sit back and relax as we get started with this modeling. Hello, my name is Dr. Michael Okreke. Welcome to CM Videos. This is a YouTube channel where we try to help you create effective computational modeling solutions to whatever computational problem that you're dealing with. The outline that we're going to work with includes, first we're going to introduce uh, a porous media and talk about the applications where these materials are used. Then I'll look at theoretical considerations that you have to make when you're trying to work with porous media because we need to first design this media before we then begin to model them. And then we'll look at how to set up this porous media within a finite element code. In this case, we'll be using Abacus as a software. And then at the end of the simulations, once we've generated our results, I'll be showing you contour plots generated from this kind of simulation, as well as the strategies that I take in plotting stress and strain plot. So thinking about the introduction to this kind of material, so basically porous media is a material that contains pores, and these pores are usually regarded as voids. The voids or the pores are typically filled with air or a different kind of of gas and also a liquid, they are usually rated in terms of their porosity, in other words, their void fraction. So what percentage of the structure is contains this, this void. So this is how you rate one. And the typical properties that you use when measuring this porous media could include things like its lightweight properties. The essence of introducing pores is to make the material lightweight. And of course, as you reduce the weight of the material, you're compromising on its strength. So you need to also be able to measure the strength and the strength can be both tensor properties and compression properties. And finally, there is also a measurement around permeability because the essence again of introducing pores is to make it permeable to gas and permeable to liquid. Now, the kind of applications where this porous media ideology is used are things like, you know, if you look at modeling sugar cubes or some kind of natural rock systems, these are systems that have porosities in them, or even biological systems like bones or even soil. These are applications where porosity becomes an important consideration. In terms of synthetic materials, open cell ceramics are also porous media. Even cement that are used in buildings are serous media, uh, porous media. And more importantly, metallic phones um, are also porous media. In fact, we'll be modeling here with aluminum, which is a, a sort of a metallic foam. Now, Let's think about the design of a porous media. I mean, the first thing in this case is that we're going to be looking at a 3D system. Uh, so our representative volume element will be a cubic RV with dimensions of 100 by 100 by 100 micron. We've chosen a uniform porosity size of 30 microns in diameter. Our pores will be spherical in shape. And the void volume fraction, we're looking at something really, you know, um, very low, a void volume fraction of 20% as our porosity for this material. The kind of cell type we're using for this modeling will be based on a sealed or closed cell void type. What this basically means is that the voids do not really talk to themselves. They are kind of sealed independent. Um, but there's also another type of void type where they are open cell, in which case one void connects to another. And this is really essential when you're looking at modeling things where permeability is an issue. So in this instance, our systems are just sealed. And this is a relationship for calculating the void um, volume fraction of or the void porosity. And if you rearrange the equation, then you can actually calculate the number of voids. I've used this round function because I want an integer for my number of voids. How do we actually go about creating this randomness that we talked about? The approach that we're going to use is something that is very common, something I've spoken a lot in this channel, and this is the Monte Carlo approach using the random sequential absorption. If you're interested in this, I've put a video here which can help you understand more about this Monte Carlo approach. I'm using a software and it's called the Monte Carlo Gen 3D version 1.0. So it's implementing this Monte Carlo approach, but it's for a 3D domain. And in this 3D domain, our sphere is the inclusion that we'll be using here. So how do we go about calculating actually the volume of the poles? So the principle here is first, we get the volume of the metrics and then we subtract the volume, the cumulative volume of the poles. Okay, so let's think a little bit about the design for that design of this. So basically we start with an aluminum, we create the voids and then you match them to create the bubbles and, and, and the metrics. And then you have to extract 
the voids from the aluminum matrix and that creates our voided um, porous aluminum. So the material properties that we are going to be used for our modeling will be aluminum basically and the kind of aluminum will be things that you use in impact absorbing structures and the property would be a perfectly elastoplastic material behavior within Abacus that we'll be using and these are the properties for this material. So now the case studies that we're going to be looking at for here with first and we will consider the uniaxial extensile deformation for this material, the implant properties and the XY shear plane for this material will do the kind of things that we'll be looking for here. So just to look a little bit more on the boundary condition associated with this. So first the uniaxial tensile case. So this is a side view of the voided material and then we're going to pin it on the back and the front with roller support in order to create uniaxial deformation and we need to create a set which is the X front set and then we need to also find the reference point. So we'll create a reference point somewhere far from the material and this reference point will be the point that we're going to use to apply our load. So we're going to apply a displacement loading on that reference point. But unfortunately, this is different from the material. So there has to be a way to connect that reference point to the material so that every load that is applied on this material is transferred to that reference point. So how do we go about doing that? We need to introduce a constraint equation which basically ties the behavior of that reference point to this X front set. And that's what we see here. Of course, the mathematics behind that, the canonical equation that defines the behavior of the reference point to the behavior of the X front phase is essentially this. What it's saying basically is that the formation in the X direction of the set on the X front in the X direction will be equal to the deformation of the set of the reference point in the X direction. But because the canonical equation needs to be equal to zero, if you're interested in learning a little bit more about this, again, I made a video which I put in the card here that can help you. Or maybe you can also dig up this textbook that I wrote a few years ago, which can also help you. So focusing on this a little bit more, how do we then bring this information into Abacus, which is a software we're going to use? So there is this feature in Abacus called the star equation. And this is the way the star equation will be written, basically within the input file. So the star equation will be written this way. And basically, what you see here first is number two talks about the number of terms in the above equation so there is term one and term two in this canonical equation this the last two rows or uh, columns here are the coefficients of the above equation so we get plus one and minus one here and then this variables here the x front set and the rp set are basically the nodal coordinate the nodes the nodal sets so the X front nodal set and the representative point or the reference point nodal set. And then finally, what you see here is the degree of freedom. And since we're interested in X deformation, our X deformation in Abacus is usually one axis. And so the degree of freedom is the one material reference frame, which is what you see. Okay, so about the shear case. So it's a similar kind of situation that will apply. So basically at the back end here, it will be securely fixed. And then there will also be a roller support at the front end on the X front set because then we need it to deform in the y axis. So the reference point will still be there, but because we're looking at shear on the xy plane, there will be a deformation in the y axis in this instance. And so this y axis means that this face will then deform and the back is fixed. As usual, we need to make a connection between the two. So this is kind of what you get here. And the same kind of argument, what is a canonical equation, a similar canonical equation as before. Now we are interested only in the degree of movement in the y axis, and the star equation will look like this with the only change being in the di direction of the formation. So we are looking at only the two axes in this instance. All right, so the final thing is how do we actually get stress strain data from this kind of study? So the, the first thing is we need to look at how complicated this problem is. So basically this is our, our system. The length, original length is L0, but we need to be aware of what's happening here. So the reaction force acting on the system and the displacement will be extracted on this front face which is our reference frame face that we're using the surface area will also have to be extracted on that face and the problem here is that our surface area is an irregular surface area so it's an irregular surface area so what do we do when we're working with an irregular surface area we can't just sum up the length times width times height because that would be inaccurate so i've written a script here which will help you extract the surface area for a system like this the script will be in the description section of this video for you to download and use to calculate the surface area of a system which has an irregular shape like in this instance so once we get the surface area then we can calculate the stress being forced divided by the original or that reference surface area 
and the, dis the strain is the, rich, the displacement u divided by L0. So these are the two values that we're going to use to calculate our stress strain data. Let's now go into Abacus and begin this modeling. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do is to generate this uh, random style distribution of porosities within, you know, within the aluminium metrics. And we're going to use Monte Carlo Gen, which is a software that I've developed to do this. So please check in the description section for the, the software. So basically, it will come something like this. So there is a computation options bar. If you've already seen my video, which I put in the link here, where I talk about Monte Carlo Gen 2D, you already know about the structure of this. So please do check it out. So basically, what we have here is you need to specify the X, Y, and Z axis, lengths associated with the system, the diameter of the porosity that you're looking at, the volume fraction specified in decimals, and whether you want periodicity of material to, to show in your case. And this is basically what we have. So once you specified all that, now you need to run the code. So if we right click and run the Monte Carlo gem here, so it will basically run and then it will show us what it's trying to do. It gives us the progress. And then in the end, it populates the domain and we see this is the result of our system that's been generated. So we've got that. Now, the next thing we need to know, be aware of is when you open the file here, there is a, an abacus file, you know, there is a, a Python script that is generated. So we're going to use this Python script for running our model. Okay, so this is a typical Python script that is generated from this. And so what we're going to do with this Python script is we're just going to copy all of it. And then we go into abacus and right at the foot of this, we're going to paste that. So what we're going to basically do is going to create the domain automatically for us and we generate all the structures that we need. So we've got it in this way. First, we go to the assembly section. So within the assembly section here, we already have all the files open that we need, all the materials open. So I'm going to create just the voids alone. Go to the assembly module and then we'll create basically voids only. So let's call this voids only. And then we're going to basically merge them into one system, we'll remove every intersecting boundaries. And then we'll put here and select from spherical one, I press down shift and select the last one. So what this does is that it basically selects the spheres and creates one entity called that. Then we'll do the same thing again. Now we're going to call it our voided aluminum. So now we want to create a voided aluminum, but instead of a merge operation, it will be a cut operation. Okay, and we select the instance to cut, which is this system. Okay, and then what instance are we using to cut it is the voids only. Okay, so now that gives us the voided system that we are looking for. So if we look inside by switching, let's say, to surfaces, you can see it does clear half porosities inside the bulk um, in the way we expect it to be. So that's first step. So we can go back to parts and then Let's go to the top. So the part has been created, which is avoided aluminum. So we can then look at the section assignment. So the section assignment is already there. So what are the properties that we have? Aluminum. So the aluminum properties are then the elastic. So let's introduce a bit of plasticity to it. So our plasticity will be 250e to power six and 0, 0.0. So that's enough for our plasticity for this model. And our mesh, so we can think of our mesh. So it's giving us three pointers. So let's try 7.2. And then we we'll probably have to use a tetrahedral shape to mesh it and then we we'll mesh, mesh. Now, the next thing we're going to do here is we're going to create a few sets. So if we double click on here, so this is X front set. So that will be selecting the front. So Y top set. So that will be creating the top. And we'll do the same for all the models. So the next thing is that we need to find where we put our reference point. So we're going to use the query button. So to find what this point is, and we see it's 100, 0, and 100. So we're going to create a reference there. So by using, so if we go back to parts module, so tools, uh, reference point. So this will be 120, 0, and 100. So we've got our reference point there. And then we could also create a reference point set. 
and that will be associated with this okay so we've got that so the next thing we need to do is to create a step so we're going to call this our loading step okay and then history output so our reference point history output so this will be associated with that and we're going to create these variables reaction forces and displacement and then we can then start thinking about boundary conditions so so what i'm going to do is my x back as a roller so we select the back and so we fix it in the one direction so y base roller so that would be in the two direction and z back roller and this would be in the third axis. So we fixed it in the normal way and then we need to apply our load. So I'm going to call this my load. It will change to a loading step and that will be attached to the reference point. And for this first instance, let's do a 20. So this is like 20% loading. So we could go and change the name of that file. So we call it voided alumin extends. Okay, so that's for the tensile case. So let's create a copy and then do the same for the XY shear. So with the XY shear case, okay, so everything will probably look the same. Okay, so there's something we've missed. So we'll go back to the X tensile case. We need to make a connection between this reference point and that face, just like was shown here. So how do we do that? So we'll create a constraint equation. So our constraint, I'm going to call this our constraint equation. Um, and this would be based on coefficients like we showed here. The set will look first the X front set in the one degree of freedom, one degree of freedom and the reference point and minus one. So just the way it was shown here. Okay, so this now we've made a connection between this and this and the model is ready to run showing XSR deformation. So we'll go and do the same in the Y case. So everything remains the same. Our loading will obviously be different. So our loading will now have to be in the Y axis. So we'll take it away and put in the Y axis. And so that means the body is moving up in this direction. Our boundary conditions in the back would have to change. It would be a fixed case, just like we showed. So fixed in the X and Y direction and the other cases will have to be suppressed. So we need to create another, which is the X front roller, X front. So it will be an initial boundary condition and that will be associated with the X front. Okay. So this will be constrained in the X direction because we want it to move in the Y direction. So we've got that. We need to create a constraint equation for that. So constraint equation for that would be, okay, one, we start with the X front, but now in the two degree direction with the reference point and minus one for the coefficients. So again, we've linked the behavior of that phase to that phase and we've got appropriate boundary conditions for them. So the next thing we just need to do is to create jobs for them. Okay, so we've set up the job and we're going to send it to run. And okay, so this is the first simulation of the extensile case for the porous aluminum media. So if we just animate this a bit so you could see what's happening here. So you see a nice uniform deformation in the uniaxial case for this material. And this is basically the word means stress. So if we switch that to the stress purely in one direction, you get some interesting results. It would really be good if we look at the plastic strain. So if you look at the plastic strain, it does give you again some interesting result of what's happening right in the material. And you see it's stressing distribution across the domain. And nice behavior across the whole block with stress concentration but clearly the void is having an influence on the behavior of the system so and this is why this is an interesting kind of simulation that we need to run so that's what we see with the uniaxial case so what about the shear case okay with the shear case you get a similar kind of result you know with the body deforming in a pure sh in, a, in a simple shear manner so the top end is being sheared and the back is fixed and you could see again a distribution of stress nicely within the domain if we look at the plastic strain so you could see again a nice distribution of shear stresses across the structure in every every way 
so what about we look at the s12 plane so this gives you the distribution of stress in the s12 plane for this material which is basically the dominant shear case so this is the dominant shear case in the one two plane and you get some interesting results so clearly the voids have got effects from what we can see just looking at this you know from a simulation point of view so the next thing we need to do is to extract the stress strain properties for this material so in the first instance here we find the strain tensile case so i'll click on this all right so for tensile case the reaction force in the one direction and displacement in one direction is critical so we'll take that and we'll plot it so it gives us a really nice distribution of the stresses on the x and y plane so then we'll need to bring this out to excel utilities current plot so this what this will do is i will export this data into an excel data file so an xy data sent to excel and if we open our excel so we'll see okay it's written those data for us so we'll copy that so i've already prepared this file containing the information that we need so if we paste it here so basically this is time reaction force in x axis time and displacement in x axis so we've got that and then we'll get the force data our strain data is also calculated here for us and our stress data is also calculated here for us interestingly as the actual area of that x phase is also being put in here because i've done this before but how do we actually get the data for the share for the phase considering that it's not we can't really use this if we use this this will be around 10,000, which is too much because the phase that we are looking at is actually a voided phase so it's a voided phase like that so what we're going to do is to try and see if we can calculate that so how do we calculate this area on this phase so the first thing we need to do is to query so i'll click on that and i want to know exactly what this a point on that phase is so i could zoom in and pick a point on that phase and click done so it gives me the data and say that point is 60 557 and something like that so i basically need to copy all of that point so Control c to copy then i already created a python script which is this so that helps to do this so basically what the python script asks for is the reference face point that i've copied so i'll paste it in there now what is the model name so we'll go back here and look at our model name voided aluminium main and what is a part name voided alum okay voided alum is a part name voided aluminium name so we'll supply that because then the code need to work with that so once we get that information now it runs through so the first thing it does is that it finds the model you can calculate the volume of the model if you want and then find which instance are we looking at there's only one instance in the model and then find the a point associated with the face and this is what you see here and then in the end it calculates the surface area so i'm going to copy this so i'll control c to copy I'll go back to abacus and then i'll paste it here so that it can work out what that value is for me so if you see right away it's calculated in, in the end it printed out the surface area to be 8139 so i'll just need to copy that so that's the surface area of that phase of interest then i'll need to go back to my excel file and change it so i'll paste that value in there so that means this is the real surface area for that face which the code gave me and then i can do the same for the shear case because the shear case is the same so this is for the shear case scenario so we we'll run this and then we we'll look at the history output of that face so we're looking at the reaction force in the two directions let me into two directions for the shear case we we'll plot it so again we get that data and we just need to say okay fine i want to excel utility data export and then we get this into excel as well and with that excel data we'll copy it so this is our excel so we'll copy that from excel and then we'll go to formatted data that i have and we'll paste that information there so they give us as excel data share data and based on the actual computer based on the actual area so how do we know that so our force here will be the force divided by the area the actual area not just this three which will be 10,000 so it's much less than 10,000 the same for the tensile voided case so when you compare this data what you see is effective properties intention and share so this is a share case and this is a tensile case and you know it gets you some interesting behavior for this material now the final thing is to look at the data that we generated and see what it actually tells us in terms of effective properties and modulus and what you can instantly begin to see with here is that for the tensile voided cases the modulus has reduced 
if was originally 75, but due to the effect of the void, it has reduced to 55. The effective strength was 250 initially, it has reduced now to 205. So definitely the void is having an effect on it. And the same thing is also translating even to the shear modulus and the strength in the shear direction. If you're interested in generating porous media manually without using a scribbler like I've shown here, this is the video that will help you. And again, if you want to learn a little bit more about present volume element modeling and other kind of advanced material modeling, I've put a playlist here that you may be interested in looking at. Thank you for your interest in this channel and I'll see you in the next video. Bye-bye.